Okay. Hopefully you can see your slide. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. We're good. Thank you. You might need to tell me 15, 20 minutes are up. So I'm calling from Denmark. My, my apologies for not making it. Uh, family sickness. Hopefully uh, it will not affect the presentation. What I'm going to talk about today isn't directly archaeology, but it is, it is related to it, fundamentally. Um, and it's more towards heritage, and it's more towards communicating archaeological knowledge. So, um, my first point is that the archaeologists that I've dealt with, when I talk to them, the information that they present me with, their knowledge, their experience of their site, never goes into the final report, it doesn't go into the final model. So I call that the experiential detective work. And what I've been trying to do lately is work out how to bring that back into the, the communication process with the audience. But secondly, when we try and create archaeological models, heritage models, etc., we have this issue which I haven't seen debated or discussed in many of the conferences I've been to, which is whether the archaeological models which are required by archaeologists, art historians, architects, etc., are the best models with which one should communicate to the audience, to museum public, to people who attend exhibitions, and so forth. And the second thing is, uh, what are we trying to present to them? Are we really just trying to recreate what is in books? Are we trying to give them an idea of the conflicts and controversies that we have uh, experienced? or that we have written about, or that we deal with in, in the conferences, or in our academic forums? Are we trying to get them inspired? Or are we trying to get them to dig out themselves to research, the fundamental research? And over the last 10, 15 years, uh, it seems to me that some archaeologists who deal in virtual heritage, who deal in the reconstruction or simulation of past events and sites, some of them see the virtual model is, is just a gateway into a book. And I think that's a mistake. I don't believe that virtual reality technology should take over books or replace them, but I also don't see why we should uh, try and ape the book. I think we should be trying to explore what is the unique or new features of digital media and how that can help. So when I talk about virtual heritage, I don't just talk about material remains, I talk about the hypotheses, the controversies, the dilemmas. I talk about it, the intangibles, of course, the anthropological, because in the site that I dealt with about 15 years ago, Palenque in Mexico, uh, the so-called scientific testing of the remains conflicted with the ethnographic, with the linguistic history, and it turned out that the intangible heritage, if you like, was actually more correct in that case than the scientific testing at the time. So um, I include all of the information and all of the historic shareholder information as well. But when we talk about virtual heritage, the heritage component also includes the inspiration element. People are, people are supposed to learn why we decided it was worth preserving, why we gave something world heritage status. And I'm not sure if all the audience knows, but uh, in some cases, people have lost the world heritage status of their site because they tried to beautify the environment because tourists didn't like it. So it, it's not a permanent economic benefit to people. Um, secondly, I believe that digital media doesn't actually just have to help recreate this perfect model. You can augment things, you can filter, you can constrain, particularly with virtual reality. So a lot of people tend to think virtual reality is the simulation of the real, or recreation of the perfectly real, but a study done by Lyndon Mossaker about 1991 um, suggested that that's actually a, a fair fee. Um, with virtual environment technology, you can actually constrain people so they experience things as the locals might have experienced them. And um, secondly, I'd like to argue that the virtual environments we've seen so far, they might be extremely complicated, expensive models, but their interaction history, what they record and how people interact with them is particularly primitive. And if virtual reality is the, the sensation of being there, then there's the problem of, of 
the past and the present and what being there means. Uh, and the Presence Research Society, which I, I respect for many reasons, the, one of the definitions of, of being there in a virtual world, I'm uh, sorry, one of, one of the definitions of presence, of being present in a virtual world is being there. Because presence is actually very hard to define in terms of experiments, and whether it's immersion or, or so forth. Um, the problem with that, though, is that what does being there mean? What does being mean? And what does there mean? So the, the last point I'd like to say is that we don't typically have in these archaeological models, these heritage environments, ways of tracking people, seeing what they, they're doing, and whether they can all be in crowdsourcing. Um, whether we can find out what people are doing and enjoy through the way they interact with the model. And we don't want to interrupt them and ask them a question because that would destroy their immersion and they typically, well, they often don't tell us what we're really trying to find out, they often tell us what we want to find out. So that's another problem with some of these models. And yet when you look at archives, for example the British Library, a lot of their work now is, is, is being done with people, crowdsourcing apps and so forth. So why not also public presentation of archaeological knowledge. And another point is, um, and don't worry, I will show a picture soon, it is the, the problem of rituals. Um, game design scholars typically um, say that games are rituals and they, they point to all these things that happen in games and what happens is they're confusing repetition with a ritual. And yet when you try and design a virtual heritage environment, uh, there's almost no virtual heritage environment with a ritual which people can take part in for the various reasons I mentioned in the slide. And that's something else that I, I also want to uh, try and work out how we can include rituals in the way of learning about how artifact, artifacts were used in a past environment. So can we crowdsource ourselves? And um, how can we actually constrain the user? And how much individual freedom should we allow to the users? About 10 years ago, when we were designing virtual worlds of the past, they thought, um, virtual worlds in history don't work because there aren't other people, so let's bring in other people. And what typically happens when you allow people in as a multi-use environment is they start talking about what's in the newspapers. So there's a problem there. Now, uh, there are many archaeological models available online now, and uh, for example, this one I'm sure most of you know about. Um, which is uh, originally from UCLA and uh, I think it's Virginia. And you can, down, you can download or at least experience that in Google Earth. And um, it's, it's apparently a very precise model that went for a large committee of academics. However, um, what, what was valuable about it or what you can learn about it is not clear from the model. And at this point, if I was present, I'm sure someone from the audience would stand up and say I should read the London Charter of Virtual Heritage Models. However, the London Charter of 3D Models, wonderful though it is, it doesn't really explain the formative side of how we build an educational experience around these 3D models, which is how virtual heritage has been defined by various people. And this definition is 13 years old. And, and the reason it's important is we actually need new ways to engage the, the students and the public. And if you have a four-year-old child, they're probably doing 3D modeling through Minesweeper. They're probably thinking every computer screen is a touch screen because they grew up on an iPad. And the, even the teenagers today, they're thinking differently, they're writing differently. That said, throwing digital media at archaeological exhibitions can be a waste of time. In this museum of Bergamo, it has a lot of community, crowdsourcing, collaborative, creative work, and none of it's digital. So all they've done is thematically think, once you go for this exhibition, here are some crayons, here's some cardboard, make your own mask, make your own exhibit, and the children love it. So I'm not saying that digital media or games, or games are always the solution to the problem. <laughs> However, there are some interesting funding issues. So as you probably know, with EU Horizon, there doesn't seem to be much money for academics to do research and cultural heritage. However, there's a lot of money for infrastructure. There's a lot of money for Europeana. And uh, they've freed up 20 million, ob 20 million objects per se, 22 of which are 3D. And Karare, which is the slide on the left, they talked about the library sharing a template of knowledge and they created a technology in which a lot of these 
virtual reality models could be shared in a PDF. I don't think that was the right answer for various reasons, but the, the way in which research is sorry, the way in which research is going, um, I think that we actually start needing need to look at reusable data and ways in which the public can add on to things and incorporate things. So my simple answers are um, we need to record and integrate the discovery process of how material is discovered in the field into the final exhibit or experience itself. We need to use the game engines and the game metaphors more effectively. And at this point one might say, why use a game engine? Well, we could use a 3D real-time rendering engine. That is also a game engine. So the game engines now, they have built-in tools that are faster and more easily updated than the current technology that we have in terms of virtual reality. And now you can you can create a cave, for example, a four to six up wall just using the cheap game engine. So they're more flexible, in some ways they're more powerful, and they're more ubiquitous. However, that last point there, uh, game theory hasn't really caught up, or perhaps it's not particularly interested history and heritage, because what we need to do is create theories that are scalable, easily tested, and falsifiable. Um, and that's, that to me is a missing field in, in the virtual heritage side of archaeology. So uh, I've just mentioned some of the reasons to, to use a game in terms of technology, graphics, storage, and speed, in terms of the ways in which they can now take archaeological and GIS information the ways in which they help people train, the user documentation is often better and built into the game, um, and they allow crowdsourcing, social media, etc. And the technology, and, and particularly in terms of heritage and history, is, is quite interesting. The way in which you can integrate visual uh, information into, say, the map reading into the head up display, um, the way in which you can use maps, not just to orientate people and navigate, but also to give them an idea of what individual players or characters are thinking in the game. They're very imaginative in the way they use technical constraints, in some cases the simulation of mythology. But one has to ask, how do they help in particular learning about, say, archaeology? Well, there's quite a few games out there and quite a few that have disappeared, one of which um, I think is, well, first, one of which I think is brilliant, which I haven't found lately, is called Arctic. Um, so, in a sense, it's pretty hard to categorize these, and I'm going to change this, this categorization later. This is from a paper I wrote about four years ago. But most games, in terms of archaeology, tend to be tourist games or perhaps travel games, and that is, you wander around and you look at things. Which is fair enough in itself, so it's, it's in a way an explorative environment. But the more interesting one are the puzzle games. So, as I mentioned, Arctic uh, was a 2D game in which you had to work out where to find objects. You had to actually click on a spot, and then dig a spot, and you had to work out in terms of the landscape and the terrain. So, it gave you information about climate and geography and the type of artifact, and you had to guess where to dig. Unfortunately, as I said, it disappeared. The second type of puzzle game was the Quinn. Tomb of the Magic Kingdom, um, which was based on actual puzzles and traps sort of the forbidden city, and you didn't actually see other people, but you had to work out how to, to, to escape through the forbidden city by unlocking these Chinese puzzles. So that was another interesting puzzle game. And of course there are resource management games that many of you know, and many of you might even teach in archaeology, like Civilization being the famous one, but the way in which Civilization is based, the, the formulae, and of how Romans or Egyptians can build cities. That's completely hypothetical. Um, historical battles as well. Um, people could learn about historical knowledge, but often that's outside of the game, through trying to build objects themselves and put them into the game. Role-playing games, I think, have huge potential, but actually the digital games that we currently have, you know, Oblivion and Skyrim are probably two of the more famous ones, they're not really role-playing games. You choose a character and points are based on, say, an alpha or a wolf or whatever, but you don't actually have to play a role. When we're in a cultural situation, we learn a lot about culture through role-playing. It's far more complex and interesting than role-playing in games, in these 3D digital games, to my mind. There's also control games where you can control other creatures. Black and white was kind of interesting because it developed a moral dimension depending on your choice. But I'm not quite sure how that would actually help archaeology. 
and social map mashup games like The Sims and Spore, you could actually use The Sims editor to create a version of the past and get, say, students to work out how to interact, but I haven't seen one yet. Finally, another way of looking at games is to use their cameras to get students to create films. So you could have a 3D game of a, with historic 3D assets and then get the students to create a film using the machine and the game tools. But that's still not getting us close to where, to, to where it could be really useful. And I think part of the problem is where, where is the knowledge learned? So in deduction and exploration games, why well, you just, it's, it's basically hit this, uh, click on things until you find out how it works. With augmented games, um, you can use the actual site. So you could go to a Roman site, put on Google Glasses, and information appears. With counterfactual games like, um, I guess you could say, Civilization, you can check out alternative histories. But that's not necessarily exploring the original way in which artifacts are used. With Instrumental, which is, I think, the Quinn game, and also perhaps the picture to the right, uh, you can learn about a culture through actually playing with the tools or with the games that the culture had. And in this case, that, that game is based on one of the four games of Taoism, of Chinese culture, in which people learn about music through playing and the feedback is through Chinese uh, glyphs. There's also performance or role playing. I'll, I'll give an example of that later on. And the last one is diegetic. And there seems to me a, a debate or a conflict in the way diegesis is used. As I understand it in classical philosophy, diegesis is a knowledge in which is being um, told through a narrator, and it's opposed to mimesis, which is being shown. Um, but in, in film, and particularly in games, they talk about diegesis as an information which is not shown to you through an interface, but through the game world. Now, why this is relevant to archaeology is, I think, when you do an archaeological environment, where, where is the knowledge of what is right or wrong? fact or fiction coming from? Is it from the game world, from the feedback, or from, say, a teacher? And often when you have a virtual heritage model, um, in a classroom, a teacher can say, this is the right way or the wrong way or historically correct. But in an exhibition, how does a person know what, what is real, what is conjecture, what was just statistically added to a scene? So I think that's, that's a very important point. Um, and this leads me to the point where I go, what are we trying to do with virtual heritage way beyond what would be seen as a straightforward archaeological model? And that is, we're trying to uh, get people to say, what did X mean in time and space and cultural perspective, and to whom? And that was the point of, of the heritage aspect, which I don't think is totally covered in, say, digital archaeological models and papers. Now, some of my past work, I'm just going to, I'm probably close to the 15, 20 minutes, so I'll briefly go over this. Um, I've tried to get students involved in archaeology who aren't archaeologists by building games on archaeology. And this is all the student work, or some of the student work that we've developed. And I'm just briefly going over what I've learned through failures, mostly. Um, so I was particularly interested in how, how, how contextual interaction can help people understand cultures different or distant to them. And um, I've use people from students and archaeology students to museum creators to language experts and so forth. And my first, um, I'll just go back briefly, the, the, the top left is actually of a 15-year-old model of Palenque, and we had three interaction modes I designed for archaeology students, and the first thing they asked was not, not where are the inscriptions or how, how, do you, how do you do this or that, that was can we kill people and can we change clothes? And this was archaeology students. So I realized that um, using game elements in archaeology is, is uh, extremely dangerous. And uh, uh, the funny thing is that people who play games, and that's it, they, they go through and they do all the, everything I asked much more quickly, but they didn't remember it, and they didn't know how to extrapolate the knowledge. They're only involved in solving tasks. They're not interested in actually, or they're not focused on understanding with a cultural specificity specificity of it. Um, and yet also, the other, the other end of the spectrum, older people who had never played games, when I told them it was a game, they found it much easier to navigate and do things, but if I didn't tell them it was a game, they found it much more difficult. And yet they had never played a game before. And I still find that staggering. So on the one hand, um, 
uh, almost everyone seems to have inherited an idea of what you do in a game, so it actually helps navigation and orientation. However, if, if they think it's a game, then what they do and the objects in the game, they assume are less historically accurate, even if they're as historically accurate as a straightforward archaeological model. So this is one of the things I found out. Um, I also found out how unreliable digital technology was, how um, and, and data collection, how suspect it was, and how there was no knowledge, no real theory of culture, and how it could be learned that could be tested. So I decided culture could be learned for observation, exploration, and cons conservation, and I tested three different modes. But actually, the way we learn culture is a mess of these things. Um, I also found that designers are heavily affected by their designer bias, so you shouldn't let them test other people and evaluate them. That should be a totally different person. But what I, what I have found from these archaeological models is that uh, a lot of students who don't read, who are multimedia students, started reading things like Homer and so forth. And they got more learning experience from designing these models rather than uh, from other people playing them. And the last point, oh, it sounds a bit depressing, but in the conferences I go to, the humanities people and the technology people still aren't quite seen from the same um, handbook. Now, there's, there's some potential answers to some of the problems I've discussed. Um, I'd just like to mention that last point in that slide, VMAS, the Virtual Museum Network, it shares people across, which is a great idea, but there's also a few technical things which are of help. Um, getting students to approach literature for actually being able to design games around literature is interesting because they, they come up with some very uh, fascinating uh, puzzles in terms of the people. Um, this is a recreation of Journey to the West, which in Britain you might know as Monkey Magic, the TV series. So if, if you're my vintage, you might remember this weird TV series called Monkey Magic. That, that was a BBC dubbed version of a Japanese version of a Chinese story of a monkey goes to India to just bring back all these texts. Now, it's actually a 16th century fine literature piece of Chinese history. But when the students created this game and they translated it from the original Chinese, they found that the, the, the current Chinese students themselves had an uh, incorrect idea of what the story was about. So that was an interesting moral problem for them. Um, and then from then on, like last year, two years ago, I supervised a student who built these Taoist games, and I found that people could learn a lot more, not for reading, but for actually trying to undertake these tasks. Because even to the Chinese, um, the way in which to understand Taoism can be quite difficult. But a lot of Taoism is, can be learned through the activities or the art associated with Taoism. And this was a project on which I will try to explain the significance of to um, so, well, extended archaeology. It's, it was actually a zombie game using biofeedback about eight years ago. We wanted to see if the environment could be affected by the way in which um, people's physiological state changes. So we took a, a meditation game, we took the senses, which read your heartbeat and your galvanic skin response, sweat, etc. And as the player went through this environment, uh, and their physiological state changed, the environment changed, the music changed, the shaders changed. Um, you could create a cinematic film. If you're feeling particularly depressed, the film could start looking film noir, for example. But what it could do is that um, when people calm down and say they enter a temple, then the actual virtual environment itself could change. So there's, there's interesting features like this. It's not a precise technology. It's actually quite good, though, as an indirect interface technology. Um, and in this case, the students uh, built an Egyptian model in six weeks, and you had to go through the, the game environment, well, the temple in the game engine, and learn hieroglyphs which would appear on your map, sort of an adventure. And it occurred to me that the interesting thing about the media is not that it's a CD or a DVD or a Blu-ray or a 3D print machine, but it's the cutting edge of what can you do with it. So in that case, when you're using the media in the classroom like they did in that link at the bottom of Berkeley, it's, it's um, always good to, to look at the teaching of it and say, well, I'm a teacher, I can't learn all this technology, but why not give it to the student 
to see how far they can push it. Another aspect which is interesting to me, and I mentioned this in tangent to, to Carrara, is can we link archaeological models um, directly through libraries and archives um, so that, for example, if the literature is XML tagged, could perspectives or slices of a model, 3D model, appear at the same time in the interface? And publishing presses like ETC Press, which is a part of Carnegie Mellon, which teaches game design, will potentially allow this in the near future. So that, I think, is, is one interesting alternative. The other is to allow people to um, create their own stories in game engines so that it could be one of various narratives. This is from Natalie Underberg, who is at the Center for Digital Ethnography. Her students recreated 1930s um, story of immigrants in the historic cigar industry in Florida. But because of the way it's set up, it has diary entries and so forth, there doesn't have to be one specific meta-narrative. There could be various versions which could be linked with fragments. So, um, now, I don't think I'll talk about this too directly. This is more of a physical environment which you run using a very cheap game engine. Well, one other alternative is the role play. And this is um, models of uh, public VR. You can download them as well, Temple of Horus and others. Uh, but it's actually used to teach classical Roman and Egyptian plays. And the students get up dressed in togas, they read from the original scripts. And a puppet master controls the game characters in the game environment, which is screened around them. You could also blue screen the actors, the students, as they're reading traditional literature into the game environment. You could also do something similar with Second Life and Mixed Reality. Or you could take something like Oblivion or Skyrim. Take Skyrim, it now has voice recognition, so you need to buy an Xbox Connect, but you could get people learning ancient Icelandic. Or you could take something like this facade, which you can still download. If it could be altered, basically these, these, they look like 2D, but I think it's a 3D game engine. There's an artificial intelligence here. There's a story of a couple about to break up. You type things on your keyboard, but they answer you with, with their voices. And depending on your responses and interaction with these two characters, they, they break up or stay together. It's the best example I've seen of interactive narrative, but it might be of interest as well to archaeology when you have different conflicting opinions as to what happened. So, I, I think I, I'm out of time, really. Um, my suggestions for virtual heritage there, I, I would just like to point out that I think that maybe the models in which the archaeology data is presented could be for different audiences, and interaction with different audiences. So, games... Games are very useful, but they're also typically destructive. And I think the next big element of research is perhaps to, to investigate what sort of interaction with models can people do using game engines and using game genres, but in a way in which they learn about the site and the simulated inhabitants without actually destroying them. I think that's a huge task, but I think it's an interesting one. I think I'm out of time. Are there any questions?